for observational learning and reinforcement. In the first half of the semester, we spent a lot of time on theories that tied into information processing. So week two, three, four, and five, all the subject matter, all those theoretical concepts that we talked about, tied into information processing. So let's do a brief review and get caught up and show how this blends in to the second half the semester. So you have environmental stimulus coming in, you pay attention to that information, and the methods that we talked about were social learning, learning style, types of knowledge, and teaching style. How that could all be used to help you pay attention to that information to get it to short-term memory. Then once it's in short-term memory, you rehearse it enough so that it goes over to long-term memory so that you can recall it. That would be information processing theory. More of a cognitive approach, very mechanical, but it's leaving something out. It's leaving motivation out. But before we go into that, let's show how motivation is connected at least to information processing theory. So we have long-term memory. I drew it out like Bloom's taxonomy. And we covered different types of knowledge so here's a repeat of the types of knowledge. You have explicit, declarative memory, factual information, episodic events, memories, goes into declarative. Semantic is broken out into conceptual and conditional. All ways of learning different theoretical concepts that we covered in the first half. So if I were to lecture, I would cover that information using this, these areas. But we also had activities in the course. That's the implicit, the procedural type of knowledge. So the psychomotor domain, actions and doing, I wanted to give you something hands-on to help enhance the theoretical concepts, the explicit side of learning. And we combined those two. But I told you early on that although we were focused on the psychomotor, the procedural knowledge of implicit learning. That was not the only form that we would cover in this class. And in the second half, we would get to the effective domain, behavior and its influence on learning, motivation, its role in performance and how well you perform, just the drive to learn information and how that can influence behavior. Also emotion. We're going to go into conditioning, different types of conditioning and observational learning is where we're going to start. And we're going to look at Bandura's model and how he took information processing and improved upon it. So now we have another form of social learning. So this is Bandura. He looked at information processing and felt like something was missing. So here we have the standard dual store model with information processing, environmental stimulus coming in, you pay attention to it through various means, the better you are at identifying steps or procedures or ways of processing information that will help you pay attention. Short-term memory, once we get it there, we have to rehearse it because there is a limited capacity of short-term memory and a limited time once we rehearse it enough and we get it in long-term memory, it's permanent, it's indefinite, it's there. Unless you suffer disease or damage to that area of the brain, it's in long-term memory. Now, you may have trouble recalling it, but once you recall that information and reestablish or enhance that neural connection, strengthen it, it'll be easier to recall, but it's there. Then we broke long-term memory, or we described it in terms of the cognitive domain, but now we're going to look at the implicit knowledge, the effective domain, instead of just the psychomotor. And that's going to connect us right here to motivation. Let's look at Bandura's mediating process real quick. I won't go into great detail because I want to do a comparison to Pavlov and Skinner and their beliefs and show how they're also connected. But let's look at this. 
So we're talking about attention here in this mediating process, and we notice that tension is right here. We have stimulus mentioned. We have environmental stimulus here. We have retention of information. Well, if we rehearse it and encode it, so rehearsal and encoding happens here, we can retain that information. If we don't rehearse it or encode it, it's lost, it's forgotten, because short-term memory has a limited capacity. If we can retrieve it, we can reproduce it. And now we get into the role of motivation, reinforcement, and feedback. So if we can retrieve it, we can practice that information. And if we have somebody to help us out, to give us feedback, that can speed up learning. Feedback can also be rewarding and reinforcing doesn't necessarily have to be rewarding, but it can reinforce learning, but it can be rewarding. Think of like the sandwich method of feedback. You did a great job. Here are the things you need to change, but overall, good job. That can be rewarding to those that need that type of feedback, and that can be reinforcing. So now we get into motivation's role in reinforcement. So all Bandura did is he took information processing, he reorganized it somewhat, but he added motivation, this effective domain to learning that we talked about in Bloom's Taxonomy. So now let's look at Bandura's connection to conditioning. This won't be the only one, but let's look at what behaviorists believe. So people like Pavlov and Skinner are behaviorists. They felt like the stimulus coming from the environment, that could be studied. We could look at that, look into that. But what was going on internally could not be studied. This was a black box. Internal behavior could not be studied. But we could observe the response uh, to that. So we have environmental stimulus coming in. We don't know what's going on here, but we can look at the response the behavioral response. Well, Bandura said, yeah, you know, we can study what's going on and its role. And that's where he brought in the mediative process. So we have input from the environment and all those steps that we just mentioned, attention, retention, reproduction, motivation, all of those played a role here internally. So he took that information processing, adding motivation to it, and then we could look at behavior. So he's saying what goes on internally can be observed. And we do that through the mediational process. So we have attention, environmental stimulus coming in. We pay attention to it. We rehearse it to encode it so we can retain it. And if we retain it, we can reproduce it through. And we can practice and receive feedback and improve upon it. And then the feedback itself can be rewarding, can reinforce the learning, and that's where motivation plays in. Now let's look at observational learning and experiential learning. Just to make that connection, not only to information processing, but let's go back to a teaching method. In modeling, which a lot of young children model behaviors that they see, individuals are observed, and then those observations, if the person's motivated enough, they will model that behavior. So think back to Bandura's experiment with the Bobo clown punching doll. So it's an inflatable doll with a weight at the bottom. They put an adult into a room the adult punched on that bag, and it's one that would bounce off the floor and pop back up. In another room, either through a TV set or through a glass window, a child was watching, two years old. Never exhibited that behavior before. Maybe had never seen it. More than likely had not seen that type of behavior. And it made observations of that adult. And the adult leaves that room. The door opens, 
the child unassisted goes into that room and starts punching, kicking on that doll, just like the adult. So that's the role of motivation in learning and modeling behavior. It's observational learning. Now, observational learning is connected to experiential learning. You can learn just by observing. So there may be things that you can do independently. You don't need a lot of help, but you may have learned those just through observation alone. So I think back to when I was a kid, my dad was always working on cars. Early on, I didn't really help out, right? I was just observing. I was too young to really be much of an assistant. But when I got older, that type of learning was so easy for me to assist and help out because all those years I'd been observing. I knew what those tools did, not because somebody told me, but because I had watched how he was using those tools. And based on those observations, I could model that behavior. So if I was given a toolkit, one of the play toolkits, one of the toy toolkits, I knew how a screwdriver worked. I knew how a hammer and nails worked all through observation. Nobody told me how that worked. It was all done through modeling. So as I grew older, there were a lot of things just because of observation without any instruction from anybody else, just from observation alone as a young child that I was able to do as an adult with no instruction. Now there were things that were a little bit more complicated. I had an idea how they worked out. So to work on a car, although I knew how the tool worked, I didn't know how it was all assembled. So then I would have to have my dad come in and help. But use of tool, I had a rough idea of how the tools were used, even if I hadn't used it before, just through observation alone. Now there were things I couldn't do yet just because I didn't have the skill. Like if he needed me to weld a part, I didn't have that skill yet as a young kid, but eventually as an adult, learning all these other steps, I was able to get to more advanced learning and those things that I couldn't do eventually became things I could do if guided. And eventually, those things that I needed help with, I no longer need help with as an adult. So that is modeling and observation and its role in experiential learning. Now let's look at reinforcement. This is one of my favorite charts especially explaining re reinforcement, how it's used, and the difference between reinforcement versus punishment, because a lot of people get this confused. The number one thing you want to do, if you're trying to decide, say you're a parent or you have to instruct young kids, and you're like, am I using reinforcement or punishment? The first thing you want to do is look at behavior. Are you trying to increase or maintain that behavior? Then you're up here you're in the reinforcement area. If you're trying to decrease, stop a behavior, more than likely you're gonna use punishment. You always start with behavior. What am I doing with behavior? And then once you determine what your goal is for that behavior, that'll tell you what category you're in, what to focus on. And then you can get into the difference between positive and negative reinforcement versus positive and negative punishment. All right, let's run through this. Let's pretend I have a young child and I am intent on using reinforcement. I'm like, I do not want to use punishment because I know reinforcement has staying power and I want to use reinforcement as much as possible. It's less likely for extinction to occur compared to punishment and I don't want to create a fear response in somebody. And I would really like to use positive reinforcement. So I'm gonna add something desired. So let's look at what we're adding to increase or maintain that behavior. I'm gonna give them something they want to increase or maintain that behavior. Maybe it's a young child, I'll give them some candy. It's something they want. Maybe it's not healthy, but it is reinforcing. It's something they want. Or look at grade school where they give people stickers even adults giving them awards for achieving a certain level. Your grade system, people that are academic learners and really want high grades, 
that can be a form of positive reinforcement. Rewarding them for completing the class, doing the homework, doing well, studying, preparing, positive reinforcement. Now let's look at negative reinforcement. There we're taking something away. Somebody does it, something adverse they don't want to increase or maintain a behavior. I'll tell you what, let's, let's do both of these together. I think this will be a better example and it'll tie directly into educational psychology as opposed to me just picking random forms of reinforcement. Let's look at Skinner's rat. So Skinner was operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is trying to elicit voluntary behavior as opposed to classical conditioning is involuntary behavior. Think Pavlov and his dog, the dog drooling because it was conditioned when that bell would ring, it would drool whether you gave it food or not because it was conditioned to that. It knew that the food, the bell meant it was about to get fed. That was involuntary. Now Skinner took a rat, placed it in a box, but he wanted the rat to know what it was doing to elicit a voluntary behavior. On the bottom of that cage was an electrical grid that would shock the rat's feet. And then on one of the walls was a lever that could be pressed, not pulled, it was pressed. Because initially, especially with animals, you may have to have them involuntarily exhibit the behavior, but then they eventually pick up on it and then they do it voluntarily. So they may have to do it by accident and at first, and then they realize, okay, if I do this, it will either stop this or I'll get something from it. All right, so we have a rat in a cage, electrical shocks on its feet. If it doesn't press that lever within a certain period of time, an electrical shock will shock its feet. So it starts hopping around. Imagine this, a rat hopping around in this box. It accidentally bumps up against that lever and the shock stops. That's negative reinforcement. It did something we wanted it to do, pressing the lever, and something adverse was taken away. It sounds like punishment, but it is negative reinforcement. We're taking something adverse away to get the rat to do something we want. So that's negative reinforcement. But initially, it's involuntary. The rat did it by accident, but then it starts to pick up. Oh man, I keep bumping into this lever and then the shock stops. So it's like, if I do this within a certain time frame, the shock will stop. And then it starts to pick up on that time interval. It says, okay, if I press this lever, maybe the shock will never start, and then it gets fed. That's positive reinforcement. It just pressed the lever, something we wanted it to do, and then it gets fed, positive reinforcement. And so the shock never starts because it starts pressing the lever in a certain period of time to get fed. That's something desired. It wants that food, and it's increasing the behavior we want of it pushing the lever. So that is how you could take involuntary behaviors as long as the animal or person is intelligent enough to pick up on what's going on, it can eventually be voluntary. So now let's look at punishment compared to reinforcement. Remember this, we're trying to decrease behavior and reinforcement, we were trying to increase it. So negative punishment would be taking something not adverse away, like negative reinforcement, but taking something desired away to stop somebody from doing something. Maybe we have a young kid that's getting bad grades, and so we take their video games away to stop them from getting bad grades. We want them to stop that. Or maybe they went out and broke a window, right? We don't want them breaking that window anymore. We take their video games away. Now, let's look at positive punishment. This is something, especially people in my generation, will have an easy time visualizing. Think of corporal punishment. I know it's a terrible example, but a lot of us my age, corporal punishment was still used. So if we did something somebody did not want us to do, so they wanted us 
to stop that undesirable behavior, we might get a spanking. We might get something adverse added that we don't want. So the term positive does not mean it has to be something desired. Here we're adding something to it. Right? Something the person does not want. All right, that's enough of reinforcement versus punishment. Again, always start with behavior. Are we trying to increase the behavior? Then it's reinforcement. If we're trying to decrease the behavior, then it is punishment. But don't get caught up in positive, meaning something desired. Yes, that works out here, but it does not work out for punishment. You're adding something adverse to stop somebody. Here, negative, you're taking something desired away. So these two are desired. These two are adverse. All right, feedback. There are different types of feedback and they all have different effects. If we use just positive feedback, you would think that would be something desirable. It can be, but if it's overused, then it may seem disingenuous. It may not seem like people are being honest. Oh, great job. Here's the problem with that, especially from a teaching or coaching aspect. If all I did was tell you, oh, great job, but I don't tell you what was great about it, it's not really useful. Right? You can't continue, unless you just knew exactly what I was talking about and what you did well, it's not always useful to the person. We're not providing any coaching. We're not providing any suggestions for improvement. Same thing with negative feedback. The problem with negative feedback, if I'm like, terrible job, and that's all I did, well, I, again, I didn't give anything constructive. And it can create a lot of anxiety and and stress, and we're going to see later on how that can affect motivation. When we get to Yerkes Dodson Law, we're going to see the role of anxiety and stress and its effect on performance. It can actually be counterproductive, where you start getting people that kind of get paralysis, paralysis by analysis, start to freeze up because you start overthinking things because they become nervous and anxious. They, they are over aroused, is how Yerkes Dodson Law would. Uh, talk about it or refer to it. So negative feedback can actually be even worse than positive feedback in that it creates a level of anxiety and stress in the individual. What we want, no matter if we use positive or negative, is we want it to be corrective. We want it to be constructive. Meaning, let's say I use positive. Hey, great job at that. Here's what you did well. You did this great, did that great. Uh, you might need a little bit of improvement here, but overall, great job. So I kind of sandwiched it. And not only did I tell them what they were doing well, I told them something to improve. So that's more corrective. You could do the same thing with negative. Like, hey, terrible job. Here's what you're doing wrong, blah, blah, blah. And I give all these different things that they could do better. Again, even though it's sandwich method, it's way better than just using negative alone as long as we're giving something corrective, but it, you may create a level of anxiety and get a, somebody where they start to kind of freeze up, especially if it's something sport related. Or on a test, this type of feedback can create a lot of anxiety and stress that can actually impair somebody's performance on an assessment. Motivational. All right, this is what I was talking about with the sandwich method. It reinforces what you did well and identifies areas of improvement. You can use that with positive. You could even use it. Eh, it's, it's hard to use with negative feedback for it not to be uh, create a level of anxiety and stress. So positive feedback would be how it would be used for motivational. Hey, great job. Here's what you did well. Here are some things that you can improve upon that'll make you even better but overall, great job. You know, I was really impressed. That's the sandwich method applied to motivational feedback. Now let's look at an overview here. Cognitivism, we have the information processing model. So stimulus coming in, attention, rehearse, more really mechanical. We have Bandura where he took elements of that and added it to behavioralism, like with 
this would behavioralism would be Pavlov Skinner but he added this element from information processing to it so he could add motivation on if we wanted to look at the difference in behavioralism we've got Pavlov his dog eliciting an involuntary response that's connected it's a form of conditioning where we use reinforcement where we have if you think back if you've never heard of Pavlov's dog what happened was a bell would ring every time the person that would feed the dog would enter the door and then the dog would get fed shortly after that person would enter the door so it started to associate the bell ringing with being fed and then Pavlov noticed that the dog was salivating and then I already gave you the example of operant conditioning with Skinner and his rat and he used not only positive reinforcement but negative reinforcement to at first it was involuntary it was accidental that the rat would jump around because its feet were getting shocked and it would accidentally press the lever. But eventually it picked up on what was happening, the time interval, and started pressing the lever and got fed, which exhibited the behaviors that Skinner wanted the rat to perform. But it did it voluntarily. And then that is connected to reinforcement, which we just covered, the difference between positive and negative reinforcement. All right, if you want more information about this, McLeod has uh, some good information on Bandura social learning theory, and you can get more information on reinforcement and punishment.